Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Center for Health Experience Design webinar, why people will pay hundreds of dollars to wait two hours in Orlando for a 90-second ride but are frustrated by health care. My name is Katherine Houghton, and I'm the director of MADPOW Center for Health Experience Design. Uh, my contact information is here, and I am so glad you were able to join us today. So I just want to spend a couple of slides giving you some background information about MADPOW and the center. So MADPOW is a design agency based in Boston and Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we leverage strategic design and the psychology of motivation to create innovative experiences and compelling digital solutions that are good for people and good for business. Now, I run the Center for Health Experience Design at MADPOW, and what the center is is a community of 800 professionals and a range of organizations in the health space. Our partners include fledgling startups and global corporations. The center really focuses on collaboration. So our goal is instead of like an agency working one-on-one -on -one with clients, we really piece together and govern multi-stakeholder stakeholder initiatives that are open to and will benefit the greater community. So these are like those wicked problems about like climate change and public health or tackling the opioid addiction um, for our community. So we're trying to do very high level multi-stakeholder projects. We also have a membership model, and that exists to help you accelerate your innovation efforts. So there are very lightweight ways to strategically extend your team and bring in niche expertise. So with membership, you get access to subject matter experts, MadPow design services, discounts on our health experience design conference, workshops, and much more. You can visit our website at Center HXD to learn more. I also wanted to let you know that every year we have a health experience design conference in Boston, and that has been scheduled for April 14th and 15th, 2020. We're already selling tickets, um, and more importantly, we, the call for speakers is open. So if you'd like to present at the conference either as a keynote or there's something you really want to communicate in a breakout session and say social determinants of health or public health or medical device design, Feel free to submit a submission. Um, you can find that information at the conference website, hxdconf.com. I believe you have until the end of October to get your submission in. And we are doing anonymous um, evaluations, so to ensure that we have a large diversity of speakers. So we'd love to get your submission, so um, please feel free to go and check that out. So for today's talk, we're using GoToWebinar. And we're gonna be presenting for about 45 minutes, and then we're gonna spend about 10 minutes answering your questions. So um, if you'd like to have anything answered, there's a box on the right-hand side called Questions. Feel free to type in anything in there, and at the end, we'll go over anything you have to say. And then if you rerun at a time, feel free to email myself or Cynthia Sharp. So just to kick this off, when your registration, I put this question in there just to see what people would say to kind of set the tone for this. So I put in the question in the registration, what theme park experience would you like to see duplicated in healthcare? So I wrote down um, the answers that you guys submitted, um, which I thought were entertaining. Uh, so free rides after entry. Uh, I like that you paid once and then everything's free after the fact. Um, wait time management and service expectations from employees and updated wait times, having your needs anticipated and met before you know you need something, the ability to make it right, such as service recovery, people would like a fast pass at Disney or a Disney VIP experience, they like the idea of a character-driven narrative, fun and education on the way to an appointment, which is the main event, Automation IDs with chips that store all your information so you don't have to keep paper records. Okay, my favorite's the next one. Make seemingly disproportionately high prices relative to value look worthwhile to spend from a consumer standpoint. A happy ending and joy. A well thought out overall connected experience. 
And this one, I'm not quite sure what this means, but I threw it in here anyway, is like what a great, when a great roller coaster finished in a vertical position and then you repeat it backwards, wahoo. So not sure how that translates to healthcare, but I like the enthusiasm. <laughs> Okay, so here's the truth. So Cynthia Sharp, Sharp from Thinkwell Health was scheduled to present this live today, but at the last minute she got pulled away for a business trip. So Cynthia and I got together yesterday and recorded her portion of this presentation. So just so you're aware, it was recorded yesterday, but it is Cynthia, it's the same presentation you would have gotten live. It just makes the question and answer a little tricky at the end. Um, so I am here, I'm a trained health experience designer, I'm happy to answer your questions, and Cynthia will all, has also provided her contact information if you want to reach out to her directly. So let me go ahead and share Cynthia's video about the world's longest title of <laughs> um, presentation. So it's the first time doing this, so here we go, okay? Cynthia Sharp presenting from Think Well Health. Thank you so much for having me, Catherine. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. I apologize that my last minute travel means Q&A is truncated, but I really appreciate you taking the time to participate in this webinar. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about why people will pay hundreds of dollars to wait two hours in line in sweltering Orlando for a 90 second ride, but are frustrated by healthcare. So last December, I took my 15-year-old to Disney and Universal for a long weekend. We were with friends, and Frozen Ever After in Epcot had only an hour wait, which is really short for that ride. So we decided to do it. But while we were waiting, the ride broke down. They could give us no time estimate for when it would be up again. We decided to stick it out and eventually got on the ride. And moreover, we emerged happy. This, despite Number one, it being a ride that my 15-year-old has absolutely no love for the intellectual property it's based on. And number two, having to wait through a pretty long ride breakdown. This is some serious dark magic. How does Disney do it? We have gone as a culture from a service economy to an experience economy. You need look no further than your local coffee shop, grocery store or retail experience. Consumers expect experience, not just at theme parks, museums and theaters, but now they even expect it in everyday spaces. Experience though, is more than physical space. It's more than hospitality. It's more than a warm smile. It's the sum of people, places, platforms and processes. In experience design terms, we look at experience as the totality of every single interaction a guest, visitor, or employee has. All of the messaging they receive before an experience, the spaces they encounter and in what order, the human interactions, the messaging that they receive after. It is an emotional journey of transformation. Even if the transformation is small, like that was a really cool exhibit, or that ride was awesome, or big, my mind is blown and now I wanna take a class about natural history or this was the best vacation ever and I can't wait to come back here again with my family even though it's gonna cost me $6,000. There is fantastic research out there that informs experience journey mapping. The Doblin Group breaks down an experience, a compelling one, into five stages, three of them major, two of them transitional. There's the moment of attraction, the thing that gets you to go, the messaging before. There's the entry, it's a transition point as you step out of your everyday existence into the experience itself. There's engagement, which can be small or large. Then there's the transition out, the exit. And then there's the extension, the continued messaging afterwards. And within one seriously large experience, like a week-long vacation, 
you'll have multiples of this experience journey embedded within that larger journey. Similarly, healthcare is an experience journey through time and space. Instead of getting a mailer from a theme park or a movie theater or a museum that attracts you to come in, there's an activating event. You're sick, you need a checkup. A family member or loved one is ill and you need to go visit them. Understanding the intention and the purposes of all of the spaces within healthcare help us with this experience journey mapping. This experience journey recognizes the power of each of these steps. In healthcare, often that activation moment, unlike the attraction moment in the Doblin map, isn't necessarily a positive one. And so that transition is also really fraught with emotion as you enter into the interaction stage where you are on site with healthcare, you are receiving healthcare through an app, you are talking to a nurse line. And then there's the exit, the transition out of the healthcare space. And then the extension, all of that messaging that as a patient or a family member you get from the office or the hospital afterwards, all of that follow-up as a staff member or a clinician, the follow-up that you have to do with a patient or family member. So when we think about healthcare, we wanna orchestrate the interactions that optimize the process and the outcomes to create meaning and value for patients, families, and professionals alike. Viewing the healthcare journey as an experience journey this way recognizes the power and influence of what we see and what we feel and what we touch and their role in day-to-day -day clinical interactions, the quality of care, and its associated outcomes. If you've ever been to a theme park, you notice it's, you've probably noticed that it's organized into lands or zones. Healthcare in a way falls into several themes as well. There's acute illness or injury. There's stable or chronic illness. For instance, my teenager has asthma and he has a specialist who deals with that. And so on and so forth. When we pay attention to these themes in healthcare and the spaces and processes and people involved in them, we can begin to determine where there is overlap between these themes and where they each have unique requirements. So let's go through an example. Healthcare themes have predictable common and less common pathways. Let's say you have a family member who's got a cough and fever. Do they call their primary care physician and try and get in that day? Do they just go to an urgent care? They make that decision, they transition into the space. Maybe they make the choice to go to urgent care because their primary care physician just can't see them very quickly. Urgent care goes, ooh, you might have pneumonia, sends them to radiology. They get get a diagnosis and a prescription, they then transition out through the pharmacy, and then there's that extension. They have to get better, their primary care physician calls for a follow-up and so on. But one thing that theme parks, museums, and these other experiential spaces do really well is they plan for failure. And healthcare spaces don't necessarily plan for that really well, even though it happens all the time. So let's take a look at the same kind of presentation, cough, fever, but it's in a person who isn't quite as healthy, who perhaps has a heart condition. And so their activation moment is much more severe. There's no leisurely time for a debate of primary care physician or urgent care. It's 911 time. Perhaps they even make it to the urgent care and the urgent care is the one that makes the decision to call 911. That transition is much more fraught. It's via ambulance. And then that interaction, it has many steps and stages where any discontinuity in communication can lead to a bad outcome. There's then that transition home, perhaps it's to a nursing home, perhaps it's home with family, and then a much more complicated extension period. So let's talk about designing an experience for success and failure. Let's go back to Frozen. If you recall, I mentioned people, places, platforms, and processes. 
As you can see in this image, there are many different types of cast member costumes involved in Frozen, and not just the ones that you would expect from Anna and Elsa. In the background to the right, you can see some general staff who are costumed, some general, I'm sorry, cast members, as Disney calls them very, very forcefully. There are some cast members in Norway Pavilion costume because the ride is located in Norway. And you'll see staff members, uh, cast members, dressed like that throughout the ride queue line and at load and go for the ride. So you automatically know if you have a question who you need to go to. It's the people in the really iconic and visible Norway costumes. But if something goes wrong, you'll note something interesting. Two different kind of cast member outfits can come into play. Number one, there's the more senior manager cast member who will be wearing a thematically on point with the right color family as the rest of the general cast members, sweater and pants and a name badge, which very clearly connotes a level of authority that there's somebody in charge who's been deployed to take care of the problem. And if they have to deploy technical staff, those staffers are not in Norway costume at all. They're in technical black, as we call it, and they are working in the back of the house, behind the scenes. But if they have to come out up front, their black wardrobe indicates, I'm not really the person you want to ask about getting fast passes. So Disney uses costume indications of their cast members to help wordlessly guide guests who to go to for answers. Places. That queue line, cute and thematic as it is, is designed for both a successful experience and when failure happens. It's designed so that you can't really tell how long the line truly is. The queue line snakes through buildings and through Sven's store, so you never see the full brunt of humanity waiting in line in front of you, still to go. It's also designed with things to lean against or sit on. They knew that Frozen was going to be a really popular ride. So they tried to make it as comfortable as they could without encouraging people to just sit and wait because the line does need to move along. But the other thing it does is it protects the back of house staff and any staff who's trying to deal with a ride breakdown from that line. It's separate. This line doesn't touch that back of house area very easily. And so that allows any cast members who are dealing with a ride breakdown to work on that as uninterrupted as possible by guests. Platform. So Disney World uses the uh, My Magic Plus app, uh, which is a great way to get information about how long the wait times are on attractions and to manage your FastPass Plus. FastPass Plus is a system which allows guests to select pre-select a few rides to go on at very specific times. And you're limited in the number of fast passes you can get per day and for which rides you can get them on. As soon as there is a significant ride breakdown, again, going back to people as well, the Frozen team is deployed with both iPads so they can reprogram somebody's fast passes and give them a golden fast pass, if you will, one that's good for any other attraction in Epcot at any time. It's a great guest recovery technique. But they can also give people paper golden fast passes in case guests aren't comfortable or aren't using the My Magic Plus app. And lastly, process. Disney has rigorous process for what to do in the event of a ride breakdown. There are speakers designed into that place, into the queue line, so they can deliver messaging to guests. They deploy staff members strategically at points in the line to help communicate. They always have a bailout door so that if people get fed up and wanna leave, they can quickly and easily, but also get out of sight of the other guests before their anger boils over. The process is very clearly defined and it has branch points. So depending upon what happens with the ride breakdown, if they think they're gonna get it back up pretty soon and then it appears that it's gonna take a little bit longer, they can tweak their messaging to help encourage people to leave the line without being negative. So when we look at Disney, 
by using those four P's of experience design, people, places, platform, and processes, they make a really great experience for their guests. Even when things go wrong, it's still a pretty good experience. But theme parks aren't healthcare. At the end of the day, making people ha happy is important, but it's not as high risk as saving lives. But there is fantastic research out there that demonstrates that the experience of care can affect the quality of health of patients, as well as improving the financial vitality of the systems that's caring for those patients. So let's talk through a couple of case studies from ThinkWell Group. Nature Quest at the Fernbank Museum of Natural History is a children's exhibit. It was designed to replace two existing children's exhibits, which were fairly old. They dated to almost the opening of the museum. And the museum was dealing with a real challenge. They have a bifurcated audience. The museum itself is located in an extremely wealthy sort of suburban-ish enclave of Atlanta with a high uh, percentage of two income households where one or both of the parents have an advanced or professional degree. The children are likely to have nannies or caregivers of that sort. They're likely to go to a private preschool. These are children extremely likely to have expensive after-school activities. But the school district that Fernbank gets a great number of its field trip groups from is the Atlanta public school system. And at the time this exhibition was being developed, the uh, illiteracy rate for third graders was sitting at about a third of all third graders being unable to read. The majority of high school seniors were unable to pass the state science exit exam on their first try. Most of those field trip kids are coming from reduced fee or free lunch and or breakfast schools. So this very bifurcated audience. And how do you design an exhibit for kids who can not only read, but they're already taking French lessons and tennis lessons versus kids in a woefully underfunded, underperforming public school system? What we did in essence was as much as possible, we designed an exhibit without words. The exhibit is based on the ecological zones of the state of Georgia, starting high up in the mountains and flowing all the way down to the shores of the state and Gray's Reef. The text that is in the exhibition in units that are aimed at children is simple and straightforward, whereas trail signage, a la National Park Service signage, is aimed at parents, particularly suburban ones, who really want to know exactly how they should be engaging with their children. So the heavy text elements are really focused at the parents as opposed to the child visitors. Moreover, the exhibitions in here are designed to encourage inquiry, experimentation, and are no failure as much as possible. There's not a defined endpoint of, yay, you did it, but rather awesome, you tried. So in this way, we encourage children regardless of their ability level, whether that's cognitive or physical. In terms of experience design for healthcare systems, NatureQuest teaches us some lessons about looking at who your audience is and not considering them as a monolith, really digging into the demographics and psychographics and mapping that out extremely carefully. It's also a great example of using a 360 design process and design aesthetic to really help create a sense of place and get users into a certain mindset. There are 17 different audio zones in this exhibit, for instance, and it's only a 7,000 square foot exhibit. And each zone is specific to the bird species and the plant species, the wind through the plants, to that particular ecological zone and its adjacencies to other ecological zones. We paid a lot of attention to how people would move through the space and how intellectually we could help them traverse that space. Warner Brothers Studio Tour London, the making of Harry Potter. You would think you wouldn't have to go as deep on your user journeys on anything relating to Potter, and yet you do. Because the reality is Harry Potter has a huge fan base at wildly varying levels of 
uh, ability to read and ability to engage with content. You've got little kids who are still clutching the very first book as they come into the space. You've got young adults who grew up on the series and have devoured every book. You've got uh, friends or loved ones who are coming along for the ride and are tolerating their Harry Potter fan friend. So when we were working with Warner Brothers on this experience, we actually had to start from a very strategic place, assessing what was the capacity for this venue. This is actually built on the sound stages that all eight movies were filmed on, and it's in Leavesden. There is a roundabout, a circular roadway nearby that literally chokeholds how many people can get to this site per day. And by looking at that, we were able to figure out a layout and a guest journey that accommodated the caliber of experience that you would expect for only 5,000 people per day at a high ticket price. The other thing that we really dug into was, again, those different uh, cognitive levels of the guests who are gonna be coming here. There is a real art form to figuring out how much content can you throw at somebody and they'll retain it. And that's a huge issue in healthcare. So we looked very carefully at the graphic design of all of the content that we were adding to the exhibition. How was it laid out? What font sizes did we use? What was the information hierarchy? How much did we have to repeat certain messages across panels to ensure that guests would get the most important messaging that we wanted them to get? Where did we have to place those so that guests would see them when they weren't distracted by something overwhelmingly cool? You'll note on the lower left, there's not a whole lot of additional signage on Diagon Alley because we knew that that was gonna be a moment of deep, deep emotion, and it was not the time to try and communicate a lot of material. So those two examples, I've talked a bit about the looking at the people who are going to be coming into a space and the places and how we design them. I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different with Wizarding World of Harry Potter and Universal. And I'm actually gonna talk about two stories for this one. One is a story of my colleague, Dr. Stephen Moran, who's the uh, medical director for Thinkwell Health. And he's not a professional theme park person. So some of the experiences he and his family had, he's got two kids uh, who are still in the home. Uh, some of the experiences that they have when they go to theme parks are with sort of the naive wide eye that my colleagues uh, at Thinkwell Group and I sort of take for granted at this point. So it's great hearing about these stories through his viewpoint. He and his family were at Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Universal Orlando, and it was a hot, hot, hot Florida day. And the kids were overwhelmed and whiny and cranky. And they had left Wizarding World and were walking back through the rest of the park. And he can't even remember what the frozen lemonade slushy seller said to him. But she said something, and it got them to stop. And what she said was not about selling them a slushy. It was an observation about their day. Got them to stop, got them to come closer to her and stand under the shade of the umbrella at the slushy stand and cool off, and got them out of the mental headspace of being hot and bickering and tired and in a cranky bad mood. It wasn't done for the purpose of selling slushies. It was done for the purpose of a better guest experience. <laughs> My second story from Wizarding World of Harry Potter I am a jaded theme park professional. And yet, when I was at Wizarding World of Harry Potter, when I was at uh, the Hogsmeade Hogwarts portion of it, for the second time, I had seen it already. I was not a newbie to it. I went into the store uh, at the Hogwarts ride, at the exit of the Hogwarts ride, to buy some something for my kid back at home because I was down there for a conference. And when I handed the sales clerks my credit card. One sales clerk was in Slytherin robes. One sales clerk was in Gryffindor robes. And the Gryffindor took my card, which had one of the security photo on it, printed on the credit card, looked at it, looked at me, and then said, ma'am, your portrait isn't moving. You're going to want to contact your bank. 
And with that, we were off to the races where the three of us were engaged in a snarky conversation about banking security, Gringotts, my awful bank that doesn't have moving portraits on their cards. How secure can that be? And I suddenly was much more a part of the world of Harry Potter. I was treated as an equal. I was treated with respect, with a wink and a smile. They weren't harried, they weren't dismissive. They had a line to deal with. This took no longer than a regular transaction would. But by their behavior, I was far more engaged in the experience and was way more likely to come back and spend a lot more money. These are a few examples of how people, places, platforms, and processes go together to make a great experience. When we think about it in terms of healthcare, it's really important to consider the people category as not just the patients and the clinicians, but it's also the family and caregivers and even the community around that patient. It's the staff, because remember, oftentimes the majority of a patient or family or caregiver's interaction with the healthcare system is with staff not clinicians. And those staff interactions are a huge opportunity for experience failure. When we talk about places, we're not just talking about the waiting room and the exam room. We're including home because you're sitting at home trying to navigate the phone tree or the online portal to make an appointment or get your lab results. You can also be on your phone, your smartphone at home using a healthcare related app. We are of course though talking about waiting rooms and exam rooms, but Again, because we're talking about staff and clinicians, we're looking at labs and break rooms and hallways. If a staff member or a clinician is forced to partway through a really long shift when they're focused on thinking about a patient and they're just running to get food really fast and they get stopped multiple times along the way by visitors or patients or family members, that's disruptive to their day. It's an additional stressor. So we look at those places as well. We look at parking garages. I have a hospital right by me where the parking garage dumps you out into the ER ambulance bay, which is not a great experience. We're also looking at rehab centers, at medical offices, and at entire hospitals. When we talk about platforms, we're looking very, very broadly here. We're looking at service lines and ASCs. We're looking at urgent care and digital tools, those dreaded patient portals that can be so confusing to patients and can be such a time drain on staff when patients have questions. We're also looking at those sometimes impenetrable posters on the wall in exam rooms, the mailers and flyers that you send home, the ads, whether those are billboards, television, radio, or online. We're also looking at how electronic health records work and how easy those are to use. And processes, that's everything from making that appointment to getting the referrals to the communication to what the discharge paperwork looks like and how confusing it is. People, places, platforms, and processes. By batching it into these categories and looking at how these four things and their associated guest journeys intersect and diverge, we can find those moments of opportunity and challenge when it comes to improving the healthcare experience. Thank you. If you'd like to contact me with any questions or follow-up, my email address is csharp at thinkwellgroup.com. That's C-S-H-A-R-P-E at T-H-I-N-K-W-E-L-L-G-R-O-U-P.com. You can also contact the medical director of Thinkwell Health, Stephen Moran at smoran, S-M-E-R-A-H-N, at thinkwellgroup.com. Okay, so I'm just bringing back up the last few slides to start um, just summarizing and um, getting you, asking your questions. So, here we go. 
Okay, so as I said, um, Cynthia's not here to answer questions about specifically her presentation, but here at MADPAL and the center, we've done an extensive amount of work and experience this strategy and service design. We've worked a lot with hospitals like Cincinnati Children's. We've done end-to-end -end service design analysis and journey mapping all the way from before you engage with a health um, organization all the way to after your appointments. So um, just putting it open, does anybody have any questions that they would like to put forth? Um, and as you're thinking about that, I also wanted to point out that um, this is the presentation that Cynthia Sharp gave at our last year's HXD conference, and this is why I invited her to give this um, today to you all, because A, was very well received. It's an enjoyable way of a great metaphor for looking at healthcare experience design. And also, it's a kind of an inspiration for our upcoming conference to see if you have anything that you want to um, submit to our conference. So we'd love to have you come and speak. Um, and let me see, we've got one question. Uh, do you know of any seminal publications or frameworks to use for experience design in healthcare? Um, there is a, if you haven't already experienced, just check it out. There is the Service Design Network, which is an international organization of service design. There's a ton of different resources in there, um, but there's a book called Service Design Thinking, Service Design Doing. There's this, probably a few others I could get you the links for. I will be sending a uh, thank you note with the recording probably tomorrow. And I can add some links as to what might be some great um, resources. Um, there's a bunch out there. Some are better than others. So I just want to double check with people and get you the best resource that's um, really understandable. Any other questions? Any other resources you guys would be interested in? Um, just a couple of things that I thought were really interesting is that her emphasis on literacy. Um, obviously, health literacy is really important. Um, it's something we spend a lot of time here at MADPOW as far as content strategy, making sure that we communicating in a way that you know children can understand, adults, people that are non-native English speakers. It's I don't know that healthcare has a really a lot of opportunity to improve um, writing for literacy and the right level for to deal with their patients. So I like that she brought that up in her um, presentation. And then um, we've also done a lot with pediatrics. I'll send out a link to our work we've done at Cincinnati Children's Hospital about how to really put yourself in the place of a child when you're trying to design a medical experience and really understand its thought process. Again, it's a childlike view of a hospital, which is a terrifying place, and how to really take their um, concerns and needs in mind when you're actually designing a health experience. Okay, here's a question. So how do you create quality experiences when having to collaborate with other people, organizations, and stakeholders that might not have the same goals as you? Um, my experience has been very much is making everything as explicit as possible and as visible. We do a lot of work with participatory design, so making sure who is the end user, if it's the patient or um, administration, to make sure that they're involved in co-designing the solutions along with you and um, making sure that it's all visible and they're um, a way for everybody's voice to be heard. So there's a lot of interviewing you'll be doing, make sure you're doing stakeholder maps, understanding you understand the depth and the distance of everybody that needs to be. Is it executives, is it patients, is it patients families? I like the emphasis on staff, making sure they're all interviewed and working together to kind of create that vision. Um, creating something, um, having a lot of experience, let's just say in my past working innovation labs, uh, really making sure you have that the thing you're developing is going to be well received by the people that have to implement. And in order to do that, you really need to bring them along with you. And if you don't have their buy-in at the beginning and you don't bring them along, there's really no point in engaging on an endeavor because it's just going to go nowhere. Are there any other questions?
Okay, well, thank you all. Um, I just want to let you know of a couple of things that are coming up is that if you're really interested in creating a culture of org, uh, innovation, we have a workshop coming up in the Boston office called Transformation by Design, Strengthening Design and Innovation Capacity in Your Organization. That will be on the 17th here in the MadPow offices. We also have a workshop on November the 7th in Boston by Dan Berlin, our VP of Experience Research, and he is going to train people how to discover unmet needs through experience research. And we also have a webinar coming up on November 20th. This is with Jerry Baumblatt, and she is really talking about designing a more humane workspace, supporting employees that juggle working and caregiving. And she's coming from the really point of view that nurses and families are usually tasked with kind of dealing um, with the care of their extended family. And how would you design a workplace for those kind of frontline workers that are being pulled away to deal with crises at home? So that should be a really interesting conversation on the 20th of November. Love you to invite you to go to Center HXD to learn more about our upcoming events and our resources. And feel free to reach out with any additional questions. As I said, I will be sending out the recording tomorrow. And we'd also love to help you with any of your design and innovation goals. So MadPow office services such as we do research and strategy, we do user experience design and development. We offer service design, intervention, intervention design and evaluation, and design and innovation challenges. For any questions, just read out to me and watch your email tomorrow for the recording and additional resources. Thank you so much for joining.